the American Navy was a relative newcomer to the pantheon of greats, yet by 1900, the U.S. Navy was the fifth largest in the world, an impressive rise from their previous rank of 12th in 1870. This newfound hunger for naval power had been kindled by both a desire to continue manifesting more destiny outside of the U.S., and by Alfred Theramahan's book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Following its success in the Spanish-American War, the U.S. had experienced the rush from their first global victory, and were looking for its next hit. But in order to grow their anti-imperial empire, the U.S. would need a larger navy. Indeed, the Americans had been gradually ramping up their battleship construction, and with think tanks like the newly minted Naval War College and the U.S. Naval Institute proceedings, they intellectually were far ahead of many other modern navies despite being so new to the great game. Proceedings itself would be part of the foundation for the South Carolina class, when two issues in 1902 discussed possible improvements in battleship design, the first of which was authored by Lieutenant Matt H. Signor. He argued a possible avenue for future battleship's armament could be with 13 and 10-inch guns in four triple turrets, having amusingly enough, as the future would turn out, a 5-inch secondary battery. His argument turned enough heads to the point that Proceedings published comments from Captain William M. Folger, Professor P. R. Alger, and Naval Constructor David W. Taylor. While they questioned whether or not such a ship could ever be built, they praised his innovative thinking and held it in high regard, seeing such ingenuity as a step in the right direction. Alger further scrutinized the triple turret concept, but in turn proposed a ship with eight 12-inch guns and four twin turrets. The American dreadnought had been born. The next step came when Lieutenant Commander Homer Poundstone wrote a letter to President Roosevelt, advocating for a dramatic increase in the size of battleships, though he still supported a mixed caliber main armament. Poundstone quickly recognized that the latter was outdated thinking, and in 1903 issues of proceedings started calling for a unified main battery of 12 11 inch guns. This would be the same year Vittorio Cuniberte proposed his all big gun battleship concept, and Poundstone, Believing at the time such thinking was popular in European navies as the way forward, used Cuniberte's design as proof that countries like Britain and France would move towards battleships of this size and firepower. By now, Poundstone had managed to attract the attention of many higher-ups in the U.S. Navy, and following some refinement by fellow officer Washington Irving Chambers, Poundstone's design was brought before the Naval War College, where it was tested in war games. The results were decisive. The staff concluded that a battleship armed with a unified main battery of 11 or 12-inch guns was worth three battleships with mixed armaments. Confident in their findings, the General Board swiftly submitted a formal request to begin design work. However, no design had been reached by the following year, so the General Board backtracked, asking for a battleship to be designed with a mixed main armament of 12-inch and 10-inch guns. Yet even as designs were drawn up, Another round of naval war games in 1904 showed that this modification was ill-suited. The War College simulated engagements between the original unified battery design, the new requests they had made for a battleship with mixed caliber guns, and the current battleships under construction, the Connecticut class. Once again, the results were stark, with the all-big gun unit handily outperforming her counterparts. In classic bureaucratic fashion, change was slow. Poundstone continued to lobby the general board, who in turn tried to get the shipbuilders to go along with his designs. The builders protested, citing the classic belief that lighter weapons were of value on battleships, as when inevitably in battle range closed, as it always had in days of old, these weapons would win the day. They also argued that manufacturing battleships on this scale was unfeasible. Poundstone, fed up with the whole process, created his own design, displacing roughly 19,000 tons and carrying 12 11-inch guns. The USS Possible, as he would call her, gained the attention of the then Lieutenant Commander William Sims, who quickly endorsed Poundstone's proposal. Himself a gunnery expert who had climbed the ladder by communicating his findings on naval gunnery with President Roosevelt, Sims' endorsement turned major heads, and the bureaucratic muck swiftly dissipated. Their victory was not without its compromises, though as the bill that authorized the construction of two new battleships stipulated they were not to exceed 16,000 long tons. While this raised the ire of many, including the now retired Admiral of the Navy, George Dewey, the Navy begrudgingly moved forward. Now the design came to the constructor of the Navy, Rear Admiral Washington L. Capps, who was well suited to the challenge. His proposal entailed a ship heavily armed, packed into a small, well-protected hull. 
Far and away, one of his biggest achievements was the recognition that wing turrets were not worth their weight, despite what the European powers believed. This resulted in a ship whose armaments were in super-firing turrets, with one placed directly above the other. However, Cap's design had shortcomings. The heavy firepower and armor came at the price of speed and propulsion. Due to the expansion of heavy guns and their necessary magazines, there was very little room for engines powerful enough to drive the ships to the speeds of previous U.S. battleships. Caps tried to work the new turbine engine into the design, but the Bureau of Engineering replied that these were not yet ready. As a result, Caps had no choice but to choose the old triple expansion engines. Despite the fact that the U.S. Navy had given an impressive showing of their ability to rapidly recognize changes in naval technology and plan to incorporate them, this had been slowed by the bureaucratic processes and by the challenges of creating a final design. As such, neither ship's contracts would be awarded until mid-1906, with both ships being laid down at the end of the year. As such, HMS Dreadnought would become the first all-big-gun battleship in the world, and gave her name to all warship types that followed her design, which was rather a shame for the people of South Carolina, who could have had an arms race that helped spark a global conflict named after their state. It would not be until 1908 that the hulls of the future South Carolina class hit the water. After a period of fitting out and shakedown trials, the ships were commissioned in 1910, which was also unfortunate, as by this point they had been outclassed by more recent British entries in dreadnought design. Nevertheless, they made the USA the third country in the world to have a dreadnought-type battleship, and represented the remarkable rise of the U.S. Navy to the status of a premier power in the world. The South Carolina-class dreadnoughts were armed with eight 12-inch guns in four twin turrets in a super-firing layout. 22 casemated 3-inch guns, along with a number of smaller weapons, comprised the secondary battery. Two submerged 21-inch torpedo tubes completed the armament, as no dreadnought could truly claim to be such without them. Armor protection was extensive, with a belt ranging from 12 to 8 inches, casemate armor that ranged from 8 to 10 inches, barbettes that ranged from 8 to 10 inches, turrets that had 12 inches of face armor, 8 inches of side armor, and 2.5 inches of roof armor. The decks were protected by armor varying from 1 to 2.5 inches, with a conning tower shielded by up to 12 inches of armor, rounding out the protection scheme. The aforementioned triple expansion engines drove two screw propellers, driving the ship to a maximum speed of 18.5 knots. They also possessed the infamous lattice masts that plagued U.S. warships during this era. The class consisted of two ships, USS South Carolina and USS Michigan. Both ships had short but lively careers, being stationed on the East Coast and engaging in a number of flag-showing exercises, naval reviews, and receptions for warships of foreign nations. They would take part in a number of big stick diplomacy patrols in the Caribbean, helping to ensure stability off the island of Haiti, and later were present at the occupation of Veracruz. However, by 1914, they were hopelessly outclassed, as their slow engines meant they could not even form in the line of battle with the other U.S. dreadnoughts. As such, they were grouped with the pre-dreadnoughts of the Connecticut class during the war, and took part in a number of neutrality patrols. They would stay in this role even after the U.S. entered the First World War in 1917, with Michigan's forward lattice mast collapsing in a storm in 1918. Both ships engaged in fast convoy escorts successfully towards the end of the war, but they interestingly both threw their port propellers in doing so. After the armistice was signed, both ships brought American soldiers back home from Europe. The two ships were regulated to training duties with the close of World War I, and after the Washington Naval Treaty, they were both sold for scrap. Despite never seeing major action during the First World War, the South Carolina class had given the world something of a glimpse of what the future held in store for the U.S. Navy and its coming role to play on the seas. Thank you so much for watching. If you have a suggestion for a future video, please leave it in the comments below.